Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 form a unit in which Paul is answering a question that dogged him for the majority of his ministry. And that question is, what about the Jews? Many of the Jews in Paul's day, and matter of fact, many of the Jews today, refuse to accept the gospel because they cannot understand the fact that God has brought the gospel to the Gentiles. They say God's promise in, the, in, the, in their scriptures in the Old Testament is that the promises of God apply to the Jewish nation. So how then can you, Paul, now transfer those promises to the Gentiles? You're mistreating the word of God. You're, you're misunderstanding the word of God. You're intentionally twisting the word of God. And so here, Paul finally, for once and for all, answers that question. Chapter 9 deals with the Jews in the past. <coughs> chapter 10 deals with the Jews in the present. And chapter 11 deals with the Jews in the future. So Paul is going to deal with the Jewish question. And he's going to show them that no, indeed, I am not misquoting the scripture. No, I'm not misusing the scripture or misunderstanding the scripture. This is what the scripture has told us all along. It has always been that the gospel, the, the promises of God, would be transferred and shared equally between the Jews and the Gentiles. So what we need to understand contextually, <coughs> excuse me, is that chapter 9, 10, and 11 are not basically talking about individual salvation. They're talking about God's purpose and plan for both Jews and Gentiles, right? Not salvation per se, but the reason that God called the Jews to serve him. And the reason God has lifted up Gentiles also to serve him. So that's the context. So when we look at the context, then we can go through chapter 9, I think, fairly quickly. But stop me if something I say doesn't make sense. <coughs> and again, I apologize. I don't feel good at all. And this call just will not go away. Paul begins speaking in verse 1. <coughs> hey <coughs> yes i'm sorry i didn't um i joined a couple minutes late what book are we in romans chapter nine okay thank you you're welcome paul begins in verse one of romans nine i am speaking the truth in christ i am not lying my conscience bears me witness in the holy spirit that i have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, <coughs> is the Christ. And one of the most clear statements of the deity of Christ in all... <coughs> Wow. In all of Scripture, and in answer to those that, that say the New Testament never declares Jesus to be God, you can point them right back here to Romans 9. Paul says, to them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So Paul declares that God in the flesh came through the patriarchs, came through the Jewish nation. So he lists all the, well, first of all, he starts to say, no, I do not hate the Jews, as I've been accused of doing, because I go to the Gentiles. I have not left my Jewish brothers behind. I have not stopped caring about them. Indeed, I do care about them very, very much. <clears throat> and then he lists the benefits of the Jewish nation. And the benefits were they are the Israelites. To them belong the adopt, adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the promise, and the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. <coughs> and then he goes to deal with the issue. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all who are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. So what's he talking about? If you'll recall the story of Abraham, Abraham 
had Ishmael. Sarah and Abraham decided to help God along in his promise to give them a child. So she sends her handmaiden Hagar in and they conceive and out comes Ishmael, <coughs> who by right should be Abraham's heir. But God says, no, not it's not simply because he's your flesh, Abraham. He's not the child of the promise. The child of the promise is the one I will give to you and Sarah. Additionally, Abraham had other children. He had other children by, by some other handmaids and some other concubines. But the child of the promise, as Paul is pointing out, is what's important. It's not necessarily the fleshly lineage. It's the spiritual lineage. It's the child of the promise. Does that make sense? This means that it is not the children of the flesh or the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. So he goes from Sarah and Abraham and Isaac, who are Isaac is the son of the promise. This, In other words, the lineage of Christ will come through Isaac. And not only so in verse 10, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man or forefather Isaac, <coughs> though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue not because of works but because of him who calls and she was told the older will serve the younger as it is written Jacob I loved but Esau I hated let's let's deal with that statement because I know that causes people a lot of heartache how can God hate anybody that's not really what he's saying Paul is quoting Malachi chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 where the children of Israel are complaining that God is not treating them fairly. You can, you can turn there. <coughs> the children of Israel complaining against God that he's not treating them fairly. And God prompts the prophet Mike, Malachi to say, look, consider your situation next to Edom. I have blessed you and I have made an enemy of Edom. Edom is the nation that came from Esau. So it's an idiom that Paul is using, but it doesn't mean literally that, that God decided to hate the child in the womb. That's not what he's saying. Is there any questions about that? The, the, when it translates into the Greek and into the English, it sounds a little harsher than it does in the, in the Hebrew. The Hebrew is literally, I made an enemy of Edom, right? I have blessed Jacob and I have made an enemy of Esau. Why did he make an enemy of Esau? That's what the question begs to be asked. Why did God make an enemy of Esau? Does anybody remember the story of Jacob and Esau? Jacob, Esau was the eldest by a fraction. They were twins. And Esau was the eldest, so therefore he had the blessing. The blessing that was promised through Isaac of the Messiah. And yet, <coughs> Esau considered that blessing the blessing of God's promise through Abraham and Isaac to be of such little account that he sold his birthright to his brother Jacob for a bowl of lentils. Does everybody remember that story? It's more than just an interesting story in there. It tells us something about the mindset of Esau. Why did God turn away from Esau? Why did God prophesy to his mother that the elder Esau would serve the younger Jacob? Because Esau did not consider the blessing of God and the promise of God through the patriarchs, through Abraham and Isaac, to be something to be desired. And Jacob did. So therefore, the promise, Paul's point is, transfers to Jacob, not the eldest, as should have been. Because the eldest did not want the promise. That's his point. So his point is, it's not everybody who is a physical descendant of Abraham or Isaac are the children of promise, are the children of God. It's those who desire to be the children of God. It's those who desire to carry that blessing forward. Does that make sense? <coughs> I, again, I apologize about the coughing. Hopefully it'll be gone by Sunday. What shall we say then? Verse 14, is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. This is in context of Moses, when God says, you, I want you to lead, us, lead the children of Israel to the promised land. And Moses is, of course, willing, but he says, I want to know who's going to go with me. 
In other words, God, are you going to go with me? Because I want your guidance. I want you to lead me. I want you to guide me. And God says, of course, I will go with you. And then God makes this statement. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends on not human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. In other words, Paul is pointing right back to the, the thought that is it's God's choosing. It's not the Jews choosing God, it's God choosing the Jews. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault, or who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? This reminds me of the book of Job. <coughs> I know most of you have probably never read the book of Job, because if you read it from the verse 1 all the way through the end, it can get very, very boring and wordy. But the book of Job teaches us a very important purpose. I mean, very important concept. And that is that Job, ultimately, we see towards the end of the book of Job, although was declared to be a righteous man, he was counting on his own righteousness. He had failed to understand his need for God's righteousness. So God allows Satan to torment Job that way, in the way that, that he did. Job loses everything. Job is in misery. And his friends come to try to, they accuse Job of this, that, and the other thing. They they accuse they they intimate that God is angry with Job and so on and so forth. And then ultimately God speaks to Job. And towards the end of the book of Job, God says, Who are you, O man, to question me? Were you there when I laid the foundation of the earth? Have you seen the storehouses of snow and hail? And all of these things. And it humbles Job. And so Job, of course not. So whatever God chooses to do with me, that is fine in my eyes. Why? Because he's God and I'm not. Well, it's the same concept that Paul is, is laying out here. Uh, so that depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very reason I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Remember, Pharaoh hardened himself, so God allowed that. But he uses Pharaoh's hardening to magnify himself and win victory over all the gods of Egypt. So you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out the, of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use what if god desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory so what does all of that mean that means god has created us and god has created us with free will and he never overrides that free will but when we use that free will to choose against God, then we, by nature, become vessels of wrath. We are destined for God's wrath. Now, we all know miserable sinners who hate God who are prospering in this world. And so that's kind of Paul's point. The Jewish nation has been blessed by God throughout most of its history, even though, as I have taught you, as Chris has taught you, as Christian taught you, it was one cycle of the Jewish nation disobeying God after another. Over and over and over and over, they disobeyed God. But yet God never left them. So Paul is saying, wait a minute. What if God was just withholding his wrath for at the proper time, he could show his mercy and show his grace? So questions there. And Chris put his, face, his handsome face on so he might want to say something. Well, I'm glad. Chris is the only one not afraid to turn his camera on. I hate speaking to black boxes. Oh, y'all better turn your cameras on. Except you, Terry. You're driving. I only added off so I could eat some pizza. Man, I ain't had nothing but chicken soup for two days. Them cup of noodles. All right. 
Verse 23, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. And here's the vessels of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory that he talked about in chapter 8. Even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. And now he's going to bring out two witnesses from the Old Testament. Because remember what they're accusing him of is, is lying about God and saying God is going to bring Gentiles in. They're accusing Paul of misusing and misreading scripture. So he brings in two prophets, two witnesses from the prophets. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not, my belo was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. <coughs> what? the prophet Hosea saying right the Jews are his people but Hosea says no the time is coming where I won't call the people who are not my people now they're going to be my people they're going to be sons of God right it's a promise of the Old Testament that the Gentiles are going to be given the grace of God and the mercy of God and be grafted in as we're going to see in chapter 10 they're going to be or chapter chapter 10 or 11 I forget they're going to be grafted into the olive tree. The wild olive branches are going to be grafted into the to the olive tree. The olive branches, the natural olive branches, in other words, the Jewish nation who failed to bear fruit are going to be pruned away. And wild olive branches, the Gentiles, are going to be grafted into the people of God. And Isaiah, so his second witness is Isaiah. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sands of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as, and as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts has not left us offspring, we should become like Sodom and Gomorrah. <coughs> right back to what John says in the book of Revelation. If those days not be cut short, then, then no mankind could survive. So the tribulation will be cut short. So there will be a remnant of them. And in here he deals with, as we close out the chapter, see I told you the very very short chapter he deals with the ultimate problem that the Jews had or Israel had what then shall, uh, what shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it that is a righteousness that is by faith remember that's what his premise has been throughout the book of Romans that we now have a righteousness apart from the law that we have a righteousness of God that comes by faith what shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is, a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. God's ultimate desire was for the children of Israel to look at the cross, repent, and come to him in faith, in faith in the Messiah, in the Lamb of God that he provided, so that he could have that close relationship with them, so that they could realize being the children of Israel, so that they could realize the true promise that God had chosen him for, so that they could actually be the apple of his eye, as he calls them in the prophets. But they stumble over the cross. <coughs> Why? Paul says here, because they try to attain it by the law. Next week, in chapter 10, we're going to be introduced to a theological concept. Most of you have probably never heard it. Some likely have, but maybe have never thought about it. And I don't want you to go all googly-eyed when I start talking about it, because it's not that complicated right? It's dispensationalism, right? We're going to start talking about dispensationalism, and the, the good place to, to figure it out is in Romans chapter 10, because in Romans chapter 10, Paul makes that beautiful statement, for Christ is the end of the law, right? So basically what dispensations are, we start with the dispensation of innocence in the Garden of Eden. A dispensation is how God deals with mankind. When we move from the dispensation of innocence to the dispensation of conscience. And then we move to the dispensation of the promise. That's what he does with Abraham. He makes a covenant with Abraham based on the promise. And then 400 and some years later, God gives them a law. 
And so the Jewish nation, after coming out of Egypt and there at Mount Sinai, God gives them a law. They are in the dispensation of the law. God is dealing with them through the law. But Paul is going to point out <coughs> the law was not given in order to make them right with God. The law was given for them to understand what God expected. And the law was given to let them know that God will provide the solution. When they fall, they had those sacrifices. But those sacrifices pointed to the ultimate sacrifice. So the dispensation of the law ended on Resurrection Sunday. When Jesus came out of the grave, the law no longer applied. God now direct, deals directly with mankind in the dispensation of grace. That's what we're in now. God is dealing with mankind in grace. And we obtain that grace by faith in his Messiah, in his promised Messiah. So we'll get more into that next week. So don't get the glazed look. It's really not that complicated, right? So, so we'll stay in the dispensation of grace until the millennial reign. Then we'll be in the dispensation of the kingdom where God will deal with us as our king. So questions about that, questions about chapter 9. Like I said, really relatively easy chapter as, as, as soon as you understand the context of what Paul is doing. <coughs> he's answering his Jewish critics who say that he didn't, number one, he didn't care about the Jews anymore, and number two, that he was misreading the scriptures. So he shows them, no, it has always been about the same thing, having faith in God. That's why Abraham was counted righteous. That's what the law pointed to was the righteousness of God and our inability. So it, it was a schoolmaster to bring us to the Messiah, to bring us to Christ, to bring us to a knowledge that we needed God to intervene because we could not attain the righteousness on our own by approaching him through the law. So the law was never meant to save. The law was there to show them their need for a savior. And that's where the Jewish nation, and as he quoted Isaiah, there will only be a remnant. Why? Because they do not approach God through faith. They still try to approach God through law by their own efforts, according to the law. And that's, Paul says, that's why God has turned away from the Jews for a time, as we'll see in chapter 11, to go to the Gentiles. Right? We'll, we'll talk about that in the next couple of weeks. So, questions on chapter 9? I know that was a little quick, but I don't feel good. I need a shot of whiskey or something. I ain't got any. My daddy used to keep a bottle in his closet when he had a cough. My granny kept something white under her sink. When the, If any of us grand youngins cough, she's going to get a spoonful of that, and it burnt like fire. So, then, what was it supposed to be?